Welcome to South Bank Centre's book podcast, where you'll hear us in conversation with the people shaping arts and culture today. If you want to hear from some of the biggest and most influential names in contemporary literature, then you're in the right place. In this latest episode of the podcast, we're going to feature highlights from another great event in our 2019 autumn literature season for your listening pleasure. Just to let you know, there may be some strong language and sexual references. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Royal Festival Hall. My name is Bee Colley, and I'm Senior Literature Programmer here at Southbank Centre. We have a very special evening for you tonight, with Louis Theroux in conversation with Adam Buxton. We're thrilled to see Louis Theroux back on the Royal Festival Hall stage after premiering my Scientology movie here in 2016. His new book, Gotta Get Through This, opens, <laughs> opens to Louis bare-chested, blindfolded, and being fed strawberries and cream by a bearded man called Cliff, <laughs> and gives the reader a tantalizing taste of what's to come. Throughout his career, Louis has shadowed groups operating on the fringes of society, offered intimate portraits of famous and controversial figures, and more recently shone new light on subjects such as eating disorders and postnatal, postnatal psychosis. The time and attention that Louis gives to the communities he meets and his gentle, uncanny ability to get his, sub his subjects to open up to him make him one of the most fascinating documentary filmmakers of the 21st century. In conversation with Louis tonight is lifelong friend Adam Buxton, and I'm sure you'll agree that hearing the duo's version of Yes Sir, I Can Boogie is still one of the best podcast moments of the last few years. Adam Buxton is a British comedian, actor and director and the host of the Adam Buxton podcast. So without further ado, please welcome to the stage Louis Theroux and Adam Buxton. Thank you. Hello, how are you doing? <laughs> Woo. Thanks very much for coming along. How are you doing, Louis? I'm all right. Did you hear that? That was a nice feeling coming out and hearing all that warmth and welcoming energy. Thank you for being here, everyone. Now, Louis, your book is called Gotta Get Through This, which is a, a pun. <laughs> Did you consider any other similarly entertaining titles based on your name? The... the <laughs> I do have others up my sleeve. What have you got? Well, I mean, they're not funny. Come on. This the one's Roo not that funny. No, exactly. The Rue, the looking glass. I was thinking... They get laughs. It's so weird. Sure, but here's... If you wanted to add a layer of cleverness and complexity to that, the Rue, the looking ass. <laughs> because you're looking at things and either you have or you are an ass. Oddly enough, <laughs> that one never came up. I would, can I answer the question seriously for a second? Please. Because I think it demands a little explanation, which is, I, the, the title is one of the last things um, that I settled on. You know, the book was written. I had um, suggested many brilliant titles to the publisher, all of which uh, they didn't like because they were too literary. The dream title was a Nietzsche reference. You'll be familiar with Nietzsche's uh, slim volume of philosophical reflections <laughs> called Ecce Homo. It's I love got it. no gay subtext. It's a, it's a reference to the, the phrase that was said of Christ as the title of many um, paintings, Behold the Man. So my title, brilliantly, was Ecce Weirdo. And it, it, so it's got a messianic uh, reference, it's got a reference to Nietzsche, th philosophy, and it's a, it's a reference to the human condition. Funnily enough, they didn't like that title. <laughs> then late in the day, basically following a conversation about the, t book, the book cover, where I kept saying, can my face not be smaller? Can my name be a little smaller? Can, can it look kind of like a sort of book and not a desperate celebrity, please buy me in W.H. Smith's <laughs> plea for attention. And, and the, the, they strongly felt like, no, no, th this <laughs> is a desperate, please buy me, plea for attention. 
And, and around that time, I was like, you know what? Let's, let, let's go all in on that concept and say, gotta get through this. If you want crass and mass market, then let's be that. But there is another layer of meaning to it, though, isn't there? There's a, it's part of a, a kind of, part of your weird meme universe. Which was what made me okay with it, which was that I thought, oh, well, I'm not actually, I don't actually think this is funny. I'm, I'm putting it as the title of my book because it's not funny. And I thought I'm, I'm recontextualizing it. For those who don't know, there were T-shirts and, and greetings cards that were being sold and perhaps still are on the internet bearing the legend, got to get through this, a reference to the much loved Daniel Bedingfield song. <laughs> from the mid or late 90s. It was around the, it was during the Craig David. Okay. Era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Re, rewind. <laughs> the crowd say boat selector. Yeah. That was the similar vintage. Uh, and so, where was I? So that was, the, so, so that was what it hinged on was, the, was a wordplay based on the song. I like it. But the world of Theroux memes, dank Theroux memes, is a strange one. Do you feel as if you're being ironically appropriated? Presumably you are, though, aren't you? When people get a tattoo of your face on their <laughs> leg, and mainly it looks like Harry Potter, <laughs> but if you Google, I don't know, I'm sure all of you guys have Googled Louis Theroux tattoos, but if you never have done, do I've that. Done it. There's a lot of hits. There's not like one or two. There's hundreds of people who have decided to tattoo Louis's face. Some of them may be here tonight. <laughs> have you thought about that? Raise your hand if you have a tattoo of Louis. No. <laughs> Seems str strange when you think about it that you'd get a tattoo of someone but not bother to go and see them <laughs> during a live event because it seemed like too much of a commitment. <laughs> I stumbled across an article on uh, the Radio Times website the other day, which was analyzing some of your techniques as an interviewer. So this is Jeff Beatty talking. Uh, this is just a few of the techniques they analyze, I'll, I'll share with you. Professor Karen Leary, head of film and television studies at the University of Glasgow and an expert on screen performance, says, we can all see that Theroux is often taller than his subjects, but he tends to slightly hunch a little. <laughs> and he takes up very little space verbally, too. We've all seen his awkward silences. They're powerful social signals for the other person to compensate verbally and otherwise. It also makes people feel like they're not really being observed. The silences, that did become a thing that was identifiably yours or was associated with you. You know, I think the silences, it, it's easy to overstate the importance of the silences. Mm -hmm. A silence is like a hole. It's meaningless without the earth around it. Oh, is that, oh, is that in the book? That's good, man. You can't have a, si a silence. It, it, it's defined by yeah. the thing that is not the silence. I love it. I'm getting very zen. That's, no, yeah. But in the sense that, shall I unpack that or should we just let that, no, let no, that no. be? Well, in a sense, like, imagine if you just turned up and we're just doing silences with your interview subject. You know, hi, Louis, nice to meet you. Come on in. <laughs> silence. It, it wouldn't go very far. The silence only works on the back. It's just a case of if you've asked a resonant question or received a very resonant answer, then I have the luxury as a non-studio based, non-live interviewer to take the risk of allowing the moment to play out and seeing what happens next. Have you, if you're being truthful, ever done it as a form of, as a, as a technique for unsettling the other person? Because it can be very unsettling if you someone... You said being honest as though the things I'd been saying before weren't honest. 
continuing to be honest. <laughs> yes, of course. Because sometimes I'm in an encounter with someone who I regard as deeply dubious or uh, someone who might need some... Or, you know, I'm aware that that sense of embarrassment or that, or that sense of that heightened feeling that you get when someone isn't saying something may be required in order to, I guess, tantalize them into saying something or just showcase what it is that they are saying in a different way. We're going to take a question now, the first uh, of our questions now. Um, I read your comments on leaving Neverland, which I totally and utterly agree with, by the way. And I watched your documentary on trying to track down Michael Jackson at the time. A, what would you have asked him then? And B, what would you ask him now? Okay, great question. So my comments on Leaving Neverland. Leaving Neverland was the documentary made by Dan Reed with the two victims of Michael Jackson. Um, I uh, have believed Michael Jackson was a paedophile for quite a while. I mean, didn't take that documentary to persuade me of that. And, um, but I thought it was a kind of forensic and utterly sort of granular uh, examination of the grooming process. So that I, I sent out a tweet that said, um, if you don't believe that Michael Jackson's a paedophile, you are hiding, your, you know, something along the lines, you're hiding yourself from the facts and colluding in the suppression of abuse. Um, the question I would have asked Michael Jackson at the time I think would have been, and this was a question I'd formulated to myself even at the time, like I'd thought about this a little bit, was along the lines of like, what do you consider the true definition of love? Something along those lines, in the sense that uh, I genuinely think Michael Jackson imagined that he loved the children that he abused, which doesn't in any way um, make it any less horrible. I think it goes a certain way towards explaining both why uh, he made himself okay with it and why his victims were, 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 why he was able to groom the victims and why the victims, in a sense, were um, susceptible to the, to, to the abuse. Because they didn't at the time see it as abuse, they imagined themselves to be in a consenting relationship. And I think one of the striking things about Michael Jackson is he was telling us at the time exactly what his interests were. He didn't miss an opportunity in interviews to normalize um, inappropriate relationships with children. You know, with his Diane Sawyer interview, his Oprah Winfrey interview, he was always saying, I want to, see, with his Martin Bashir interview, it was always about sharing bed, the bed with children. He would say it wasn't sexual, but in a sense, I think in his mind he was saying that, um, well, it's not just sexual, it's more romantic. What I would ask him now, I don't know. I guess it's all, it's all in plain sight now. You would just say, in, in what part of you imagined that it might be okay to have sexual relations with a child? I mean, you, you, sometimes you just got to bang it on the head. Um, here's another top technique for being a great interviewer from the Radio Times. This one again, from Professor Karen Lurie. By coming across as if you don't have any social skills, <laughs> the other person will think, oh, that's why they're asking such a stupid question. <laughs> he doesn't know any better. And they'll give you an answer no matter how silly. See, I'm gonna disagree with that one. <laughs> I do you, do you agree with that? Can you explain that one? Well, because that's what people think, the, the, the term that is bandied around sometimes uh, when it comes to your stuff, or at least it used to be, I don't think so much anymore, is faux naive. And so the idea that you're just putting on this act of being like, oh, I don't know what's going on, <laughs> and thereby putting them at ease and letting them hang themselves, giving them enough rope. Uh... And I think maybe that's what she's getting at there. No but, social skills. I don't know. I'm just a goofball. Right. I, I guess. I mean, I don't really... Do I, I... I like to imagine that I have one or two social skills. But um, I guess in a way, you, you know, 
my career, such as it is, is a sort of testament to, um, the, you know, someone who just who's sort of disqualification, like who, who sense like, what I've realized is the things that I think I'm good at, I'm actually not that good at, and then the things that I think I'm bad at uh, turn out to be assets. So in many respects, I don't really feel like I'm qualified to know whether that guy you mentioned, the professor, uh, professor, professor Watson, Karen, Karen whether Lear. they know what they're talking about or not. Like, I, I've always r relied on um, my team to sort of support me, and, I, and, 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 and so it's the case that sometimes when I think I've got social skills, it turns out that I haven't. It's, you know, there's ironies within ironies. I can't, I can't even get to the, you know, some of the levels of it. I think some people, to some people it feels manipulative. I always defend you and have defended you in the past. Or, you know, when people have said, he's putting it on though, right? This is an act he does on TV to get something out of people. And I say, no, I, he's pretty much like he is in real life. Maybe a sort of slightly straighter version, like you're more animated in, in real life, but, but that's what you're like, and you're not, you're not thank you. trying to um, fool anybody. Um, thank, you for, thank you for defending me to the myriad people who are approaching you, <laughs> talking me down, talking trash about me that come up to you constantly and say I'm a goofball and... <laughs> So thank you for that compliment. I went too far with that characterization. And <laughs> so thank you for that. That's too much. Uh, thank you for being in my, so squarely in my corner. Listen, the full disclosure is like, I, I imagine that I've got social skills. Yeah. And so the fact that someone thinks I, I kind of lack them to a kind of profound extent is... is kind of surprising to me, if I'm honest, which may show how few social skills I have, that I can't actually even recognize who I am. Uh, I'm going to take another question now at this point. Um, first of all, I, when you both came out, Adam, you look like Keanu Reeves. And, <laughs> and that put in my... Who? That put in my head the, uh, the movie that he did about eating disorders. And Louis, you did a uh, uh, program about eating disorders, which I couldn't watch because it was filmed at the eating disorder hospital I was in. And I buried six friends. And I couldn't watch it in case any of my friends were in it. Um, and I just wanted to know what your views about how did you come away from interviewing the girls at the Vincent Square Clinic. Okay, so question about eating disorders. Welcome, by the way, and I hope your health is good, and thank you for being here. Um, you know, I, w when we were making the program about eating disorders, there's a, there's a temptation uh, as a program maker or a journalist that you're looking, you're trying to find the cause, you know, like, well, what's behind this? What is this really about? And, so part way through the process, I realized, well, I don't think that's going to get us anywhere. Like the idea that, oh, it's an issue with parenting or it's an issue with um, genetics or that in a sense, that's, an, that's a, not a solvable um, mystery. But what I did realize was that, um, you know, the best we could do was attempt to map uh, and, and anatomize as, as clearly as possible the way in which it's experienced and, and, and what struck me was that the, the, the sense in which the, the illness becomes incorporated into the personality and the way in which, oddly, it's, it's mixed in with positive qualities, you know, qualities of conscientiousness, orderliness, self-control. And, and, you know, in, in, in a lot of my programs, I, 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 I like to explore ambiguities and... I, I was really, you know, the, if anything that you might agree with, like as a cohort, the people people with eating disorders tend to be high achievers, like who are admirable people, people that you would want to work alongside, uh, or you would want, you know, to trust a, an important job to, and and that that's what's um, at the same time, you know, 
you know, we were talking about Michael Jackson. It's a sense in which it, it's a disease that grooms you. You know, that it, it flatters you that it has the answers, that it's your friend, that you can depend upon it. And all the while, it has this other agenda, which is to undermine and abuse you. So, so I, I, I think it became for me a lesson in, you know, another lesson among many in, in, in the ways in which good and bad qualities tend to exist almost symbiotically side by side. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, now, I think we've got a, a mic. One of the things I like most about your work, uh, and you as a person, dare I say it, is your reluctance to judge people. And, you know, no matter how strange or perhaps objectionable they might first appear or be, um, you say at one point in the book, the proper subject of documentaries is people doing things that they're not supposed to do. The supposed to's may themselves be wrong-headed. The people may be right in what they do, but the feeling of being at loggerheads with certain norms and conventions is always present. That's what I interrogate, that's what I'm interested in. Um, so, you know, a lot of these people that you interact with are rationalizing what most of us would consider fairly extreme or even abhorrent behavior of various kinds. Um, but we all, there's a, an appreciation, I think, that we all are rationalizing odd things as a part of life all the time, you know, a kind of cognitive dissonance that we engage in just to get through life and being alive and all the weird things that we do. How much are you aware of that in your own life? Are there, are there things that you think, wow, this is really weird, that you're sort of waking up to? Like I'm thinking about people's attitudes to animals that seems to be in the process of changing quite radically and people changing their eating habits and thinking a lot more about how we treat animals and what they go through and how we exploit them. And I th Well, that's the big one, isn't it? But I think... Um uh, you know, I think it, the, the weirdness is built into the human condition. There's many situations in which there's, there's no right way of doing things, and that every option looked at a certain way is a bad option. You know, I, I don't want to trivialize this, but one of the things I say in the book is, like, there's something quite weird about polyamory, like the idea of having multiple relationships with, uh, you know, committed relationships with other people, like being in a polycule, to use the term, of three or four, or a throuple. But there's also something quite weird about monogamy. Yeah. That you're going to say, I'm only going to have carnal relations with one person for the next 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 years. <laughs> That's quite weird, isn't it? Um, so in, in there's cases in which, like, there's no... There's no right way of doing things. And, you know, ethics doesn't supply answers. You, you, you know, we, we're given these bodies, you know, the, the, the whole condition of mortality seems to be predicated on a sort of impossible situation. But animals is the big one. Like, I think we've all been guilty of thinking, I'm doing something that I can't really explain why it's right. And in fact, it is, probably isn't right, but I'm doing it anyway. And, you know, I'm, we were talking about this before. Yeah, I'm... A, I'm a vegetarian in theory, but not in practice. <laughs> Which I think isn't actually a thing. Um, do you know, I know you, you, when you were at college you read Michel de Montaigne, the essay writer. He's got, you know that essay on custom? I know that one, yeah. And uh, his thing is habit blinds the eye of our judgment, i.e., you know, we, we just get used to things and then we think that they are definitely the right way to do things. And that anyone else in the rest of the world who does things in a different way must be crazy. But it is weird, like when you, there, there are so many examples in everyday life of just little strange bit, toilet brushes. Uh, what's the problem with toilet brushes? Just the idea of that. You've got it, what you're doing with it, and then you just, Sit it back in the little... Oh, he's going to pop it in the little bowl there for next time. Rather than kind of taking it outside and hosing it down and bleaching it and burning it, getting rid of it, incinerating it. After what you've just done with the... No, oh, let's give it a little shake. 
I, I was thinking more about t ties. We had a bit of cloth around your neck. What's it for? Yes. What, what's that bit of cloth around your neck? What's it doing? This is our Michael McIntyre section of the evening. <laughs> what's up with that? I mean, because the question I get asked more than any other is, how do you remain so calm? Especially yeah. when you're out in worlds that would be highly provocative. Right? I'll give you an example of one time that I was, I noted like, oh, I haven't seen him do that before, was when you did the thing about the fellow who uh, was drinking very heavily, drinking to oblivion, and um, he was just so lost and unhappy at one point, he just hugged you, and there was nothing you could do but hug him back. You weren't gonna stand there stiff as a board. But it was, um, yeah, that looked harrowing and sad and... And I, I probably wasn't that comfortable. I mean, he really wanted a hug. Yeah. And I think I was more the huggy than the hugger <laughs> in that particular clinch. But it would be churlish to refuse to be hugged, wouldn't think, it? Yeah. It'd be pretty weird, even for, what was the term? In a, uh, emo someone who's emotionally... In a, a black hole. A black hole of emotion. Um, so, you know, I think an appropriate level of emotional engagement is fine. I think uh, the thing you have to remember is if I uh, am interviewing a neo-Nazi, right, I've got a pretty good idea that that's what's about to happen. In other words, I've read my notes. I've been planning the shoot for weeks, if not months. I've been on a long plane ride, I've gone on a drive, I've arrived at a house, I've knocked on the door, and if the person came to the door and I said, are you a Nazi? And they said, no, <laughs> I would be shocked. <laughs> but if they say, yes, I'm not shocked, I'm kind of relieved because I know I've come to the right place. And, <laughs> and there's a sense in which, um, you know, I, that's what I've come for. I'm prepared to engage with a worldview that's utterly foreign to my own. Um, now, the exception is when, uh, if someone's having a go at me, it turns out I'm less tolerant. I'm less tolerant of, uh, of direct attacks on me. And when I made a film about Scientology, um, I kept getting accused of trespassing. Mm -hmm. And it was strange, like I seemed to be fine with bigoted, uh, you know, hearing them anyway, and interviewing people about them. But when I was accused by a woman outside the Scientology headquarters called Catherine Fraser, and she kept saying, you need to leave, you've trespassed, I'm gonna call the cops. Are you a moron? You need to leave, can you read? Do you know what a sign is? And I found myself getting irritated, and my feeling, like suddenly I wasn't impassive black hole of emotion, Louis Theroux. I was like annoyed, you know, hang on, stop it. You know, what are you doing? No, I can read and, and no, stop it. I haven't trespassed several times and I had skin in the game. So uh, is that an answer to the question? I think so. <laughs> but whether it is or not, <laughs> time's up. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Louis you. Theroux. That's it for this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the South Bank Centre Books podcast in all the usual places. For more information about upcoming events, go to southbankcentre.co.uk or look us up on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram.